I'm very excited about uh, day four because this is new material and it's based on a book, a short book, which I hope you can get hold of and read called Diversification for Climate Resilience. And we've also uh, produced an infographic which describes 30 options um, for, for building resilience. Today, we're going to start this part of the training with a module on defining and understanding climate resilience. And then we will, we will have a second module that looks at social ways, organizational ways of um, building resilience. And finally, in the last module, we'll look at ecological and technological options uh, for building resilience. And then at the end of the day, we'll give you some homework um, to list things that you're already doing to build your climate resilience and maybe selecting an additional one or two ideas that you found useful from the presentation of options during the day. Um, let me start then uh, with module 10, which is defining and understanding climate resilience. Now, resilience is a concept a little bit like incubation and risk assessment management that is really to do with loving and helping one another. Um, so in the FFF, we're really encouraging um, group groups, who are building businesses and who are doing it together, who are working to help one another. And resilience is not something you should think of as, as an individual. Uh, resilience is something that you have as a group. And this has been particularly clear in the COVID uh, year, uh, years that we've gone through. I think we've grown to appreciate how much being with other people and solving problems together really matters to all of us. Um, so I hope that will jump out at you as we do this training. Now, how do I? So I'm going to start by looking at uh, climate change and, and defining climate resilience. And the first thing to note is that climate risks are, are very much real. We're having uh, increasing temperature extremes, both high and, and sometimes low. Um, we're seeing more variable rainfall patterns um, with extreme events like drought and, and floods and so on. We've, we're, we've got fires in some countries within the FFF particularly in Latin America, in Bolivia, we've seen some terrible fires in recent years. We've got an escalation of the power of storms, floods, lots of outbreaks of pests and diseases as crops get stressed by these more variable patterns. And then things like landslides and a little bit of sea level rise in some places and so on. The human impact of this is very real. So we're expecting to see an additional 250,000 deaths per year by 2050 from temperature alone, and then an additional 529,000 deaths a year from food shortages, and about 720 million people pushed into extreme poverty. Those are really frightening facts and we need to think seriously about climate resilience if we're to help people on the margins to survive in these very difficult times. This is not just um, us uh, experts making up these, these figures. Uh, when we interviewed uh, two years ago 41 farmer and forest organizations in six countries, we were quite surprised in the area of natural resources that climate resilience information was their number one knowledge need. How do they diversify into climate smart agroforestry? How do they develop soil fertility techniques? Um, how do they domesticate trees on farm and so on? So smallholder farmers are feeling 
uh, the, the climate changes and they're worried about them and they want to know how to cope. And this training over the next couple of days will give you, I hope, some options to help them cope as we go forward. So just to start with some definitions, resilience, it really means the ability to bounce back or return quickly to a previous condition. And it's not just an individual thing, as I mentioned at the start, it's a group thing. We help one another to bounce back in the face of, of, of shocks. Sometimes we use the word resilience in a very general way to mean the capacity of a system to persist or adapt or transform in response to a shock. And sometimes we use resilience more specifically to mean the resilience of a particular crop to a particular type of disturbance. So it's important just to remember that um, resilience can be used very broadly or it can refer to a specific thing. When we talk about climate resilience, what we're really talking about is the ability to anticipate and prepare for and then to persist or adapt or transform in the face of a hazardous event related to climate change. So we've, we've listed in the previous slide some of the things that people are facing, um, temperature extremes, droughts, floods, variable weather, and we need to anticipate those as much as we're able to and then try and find ways of persisting, adapting or transforming in the face of that uh, linked to climate change. I hope that those definitions just set the scene so that we all know what we're talking about. Now, there are general principles. When we looked at all that people had written on climate resilience, um, there were some general things that they said that built that were to do with uh, resilience. And the first is that if you want to be resilient, you have to embrace complexity. So if all of your eggs are in one basket and that basket is threatened by climate change, <laughs> then you're going to lose everything. But if you have a more complicated farming and business and organizational setup, that helps you. And forest and farm producer organizations are, are used to managing uh, complex rural landscapes with multiple crops and so on. So they're quite good at embracing complexity. Secondly, you need to recognize that there is going to be constant change. So don't expect things to, to stay the same over time. Plan in advance um, for, for change. And again, forest and farm producer organizations are quite used to, to, to all these, these uh, threats and helping their members to cope. You've not only got challenges to do with climate, as we've seen over the last few days, you've got challenges in the market, challenges with laws and policies, challenges with pests, COVID, all of these things. Another way to build uh, resilience is to broaden decision-making, make decision-making more inclusive. And that's because often uh, particular people have found a solution to, to a problem, and that can then be used to spread and help the whole group. Um, so think about broadening the decision-making. Forest and farm producer organizations are often very good at this. You often have democratic decision-making where you've got meetings, you can listen to the solutions people are finding for their crop systems, for their business systems and so on. And then another way of building resilience is to enhance connectivity. If somebody has got a good idea of a new product that they think is more resistant to climate change, then make sure that they can share that idea, they can connect with other people and spread the, the findings. 
thinking in an experimental and learning way, promoting experimental learning is a good general principle for resilience. And, and here you might be a little bit more risk taking. So you might encourage people to try out in a small way, growing new things, selling new things, so that you can learn whether that will help you in the future. And finally, there's this thing called promoting multi-centric innovation. So um, if, if your farmer organization uh, is, is doing certain things, try and link to other for farmer organizations who might be trying out different approaches. So it's, this is especially important for apex level organizations. Try and learn from uh, climate resilient strategies that particular groups are, are using. Uh, so that there's multiple centers of experimentation and then spread findings to, to one another. That's very gen general, isn't it? It's not very uh, practical or specific, but I think it helps just think of background ideas that we, we, should, we should be trying to put in place. Now, climate resilience um, is really made up of two parts. Firstly, there's the ability to assess what climate risks are coming our way, what weather changes are, are happening, what is the pattern of drought, what are the predictions for the future. The second is how can we put in place a resilience response? And usually in when people write about resilience, they, they talk about persisting, and that's often to do with an individual trying to do the same thing. So if you've got a nursery that is selling seedlings, how can you persist in selling seedlings? Maybe there's a water shortage. So to persist, you might put in a borehole to enable people to persist. A second way of, of, of doing resilience is to adapt. And, and that might mean that um, if you've got one particular type of crop, um, maybe you'd be advised to work with a research institution to find a more climate resistant, a more drought resistant type of crop. And the group can work together to adapt what is being planted and grown and sold um, to, be, to be resilient. And finally, there's this uh, issue of transformation. And that means you might try and you might think, well, in the face of all of these uh, climate threats, we really have to do something completely different. So rather than selling agricultural crops, which are very um, susceptible to, to drought, maybe we should turn our farming system into a, um, a conservation area for ecotourism, or maybe we should grow trees and turn our system into something different completely. So that would be to transform the system. So I hope that gives you the basics of what climate resilience is. And just as an example, um, I, I've, I've tried to draw on some of the uh, climate resilience case studies that we've been using to develop this training course. One of them was in Tanzania with the TT Gao. And uh, in, in Tanzania, Titi Gao was really set up as a tree growers association, mostly to do with timber trees like pine. You can see those examples. But more recently, they've been broadening the basket of products that their members uh, grow and sell. So for example, they've introduced avocado and home gardening they've tried to diversify from producing the timber into also transporting and taking on the, the dealer role for timber. So these are ways of diversifying what is happening in the face of the changing climate to be more resilient for the future. I mentioned that climate resilience is really about two parts. It's about anticipating the changes as best you can 
And then it's about putting in place resilience responses. And in the resilience responses, um, I think it's very useful to break those down into four different sorts of resilience response, four different dimensions, if you like. So firstly, there are social things that you can do, sociocultural things. Um, and that really is to do with how individual producers work in group organizations to change the political and organizational system. Um, so you can see that there are, there are social things that an individual can do, there's things that a group can do, and then there are things that we might need to change in the whole uh, legal and policy area. The second dimension is to do with the ecology of what you grow on farm or what you grow in the forest. And that's ecological resilience. And that might be to do with individual crops, changing the way individual crops are getting more resistant varieties or changing the whole crop population that you're, you're planting, or maybe changing the whole farm ecosystem, the balance of how the farm is run, um, diverse, diversifying into agroforestry or something like that. At the economic dimension of resilience, we can think of ways of making individual products more resilient. So you can think of uh, packaging and, 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 and marketing a product differently, but you can also think in terms of the group business diversifying what it sells. And finally, you can maybe even change the whole market system uh, so that your, your focus of, of who you're trying to sell and where is changed. At the level, finally, the, the physical and technological dimension of resilience, you know, this might be an individual homestead, or it might be a group processing facility, or it might be public infrastructure at different levels. So you can change the, the physical layout or the technology you're using to become more resilient. I won't stay much more on this, but it's just useful that resilience isn't just about what happens on farm. It can also be to do with what happens in your organization, what happens in your business, or what happens with your technology. Okay. And there are several things that we need to just bear in mind when we're thinking about resilience is that resilience for men and women is, is often different. Um, and that's because men and women often have different access to natural resources, uh, different rules governing who owns what. And they also have different access to education and training. And that's important to bear in mind. And then they also have different responsibilities at the level of the family. So often women have a, a higher burden of childcare which affects the time when they can be involved in training and business and so on. So we need to have a strategy for resilience that, that takes into account the differences between men and women. And we need to remember that um, when we're talking about those four dimensions of resilience, they're all, they're all interlinked. So if your farm, um, if your crop fails, um, then your business will also suffer and your organization may lose members. So all of these things are interconnected. So we do need to think not just about individual bits of resilience, but about the whole picture. Similarly, if, if uh, we're thinking about resilience, we have to recognize that um, when a shock comes, when a drought happens, the recovery um, from that shock actually has, has a time frame to it. So that what we want to be put in place is to make sure that we're not overly dependent on one thing so that when a shock comes, we take a long time to recover. We want, when a shock happens, we want to have 
many different systems and crops and products to sell so that we can keep going and we don't suffer this big um, loss uh, at any one point. Finally, it's just to say that I've, I've said there are four dimensions of resilience. You could say there were five or there were three. It's, it's, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, the main thing is to remember that resilience has, there are various different sorts of things you can do to become more resilient. And I've tried to break it into four things to force you to think about not just the farm um, and the resilience, but, but broader, broader things you can put in place. And so here is an example of um, a, a forest and farm producer organization. It's um, actually the Lake Elementata Tree Nursery Self-Help Group. So it's a group of uh, nursery producers who are working together and, and they faced um, climate change and they faced uh, water shortages and they faced drought which affected what people wanted to buy. Um, and so if you look at the ecological things that they did, they started to um, sell a broader range of things so that people would want to, who were just maybe having trouble with certain crops or certain plants would, would still buy seedlings because they were offering more, more types of trees in their nursery. Secondly, they tried to get better quality seed that was a bit more drought resistant for the, for the farmers they were selling seed to. And then they also started to offer training in agroforestry to be, so that the farmers who were buying their seed could become um, sort of more diversified in what they produce, less, less, resist, less susceptible to climate change. On the economic front, they decided that maybe it wasn't good to be completely dependent on selling seeds. So they started to sell uh, uh, chickens and fruit and beans as well. Um, and, and they not only produced uh, seedlings just grown from seed, but they started to get to know how to do grafting and grading so that the quality of their seedlings was improved. Um, they set up a, economically, they set up a village savings and loans association. So they could loan monies to particular nursery growers who would then pay it back over time. At the physical and technological level, they had this problem of water sh shortage. So they looked into how to do rainwater harvesting off the roofs um, to, to, to have a supply of water in the nurseries that would mean that they could keep watering even during uh, droughts. And they, they started to use shading and mulching to reduce the uh, transpiration of water from the seedlings so that they kept, could be kept longer in the nurseries. And finally, in terms of their social um, organization, they consolidated their group and they joined a slightly larger um, tree nursery growers association of Kenya that could help them with advice and contacts and partnerships and that helped them to build partnerships with the Kenyan Forest Research in Institute, the Kenyan Forestry Service and a whole other load of other NGO partners. So they did things organizationally to build their resilience. I hope that just gives you a beginning a flavor of the way in which you can do um, you could think of resilience in different dimensions and come up with solutions that help build your overall integrated resi resilience. And at that point, I think I'd like to, to stop um, to take some uh, questions. Is there anything about the uh, general definitions of resilience or the dimensions of resilience or you know, how do you uh, mix um, sort of assessment of climate risk with resilience responses? Have we got any, anybody who wants to ask any questions at this stage? <clears throat> or make any comments?
Uh, Duncan, there are a couple of comments from Mark and from Alima in the chat. Uh, Mark was um, saying that he really liked the idea of um, uh, thinking of resilience as, um, as something that is achieved in a collective, um, uh, which involves devising solutions as a collective versus individual efforts. And he also um, says that um, thinking of resilience in terms of expanded ecosystem services is perhaps a good approach. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I like I like both of those points. I mean, I think um, resilience is very much uh, something that we we think of collectively. So if I, if I'm a farmer and and one of my crops is suffering from a pest or a disease or uh, having having a problem with production this year, it's it's both comforting to know to share that other farmers are, are, are suffering similar problem, but it's also really important that people talk together about well, okay, uh, has anybody got any ideas about how to overcome this problem? And maybe one or two farmers in the group will have thought of something innovative to do. And so it, 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 it builds a sense of security, thinking of resilience as a collective and not just uh, something we think of as, as, as in individuals. And then, and then yes, this point of um, uh, thinking of resilience in terms of ecosystem services. Um, we, we have to, to be resilient when we're in rural areas we have to have a, a, a system, an ecological a, a sort of social and ecological system that is diverse enough that not all of it fails. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? So we have to create a, um, a, an ecosystem uh, and uh, that gives us services, that gives us economic opportunities, um, even when one bit of it may be really struggling. And this is, of course, how, how nature works. Um, nature is, is very much built around um, uh, complicated uh, uh, multi-species forests. And if, if one element is struggling, then other elements perhaps are, are finding, you know, are expanding in that system to, 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 so that the whole system still stays intact. Um, and we need to learn from nature um, and make sure that our systems are also diverse and therefore resi resilient in the face of changing climate. And there was a comment from Alima, um, uh, just reiterating how important it is to, to look at different capacities and take consideration of women's additional responsibilities and their ability to to, to engage and to, to be trained at different times and uh, different settings. Yeah, that's, that's very much the case. And I mean, we, I, I know that within the forest and farm facility, we have a, quite a strong emphasis on ensuring um, that there is some sort of gender equality and, and, and that we're, we're emphasizing um, more balanced membership both in, at the level of, of the members of a forest and farm organization, but also in the leadership. Um, and we've got some focus as well on working with specific work with women only groups. But in that broader context, it's very important that women uh, can voice the particular challenges they face um, within an organization. Uh, and because often it's women who will suffer most from, from climate that affects household budgets and childcare and so on. So we, ne we need to make sure that their voice is included in our organizations and that we have specific ways of uh, making training and, and capacity building available to them, yeah. Does anybody else have a, have a- uh... Hello? Yes, Nyadia, yeah. please. Yes, um, yeah, the, the presentation has been very interesting. Um, I'm still a student of resilience. 
uh, but I think that when we 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 stop at um, uh, back at your previous um, situation before the shock occurred, uh, we will be experiencing the same shocks over and over again, and then we will always come back to that level, and then. Um, it will appear as if we are not incorporating the lessons learned into what we do. Mm. Um, we, we should admit that if FFPOs were not resilient, they wouldn't even have been around for us to be holding these conversations. So what we are doing is, can we strengthen the way the, the, the adapt to or transform systems to keep afloat? Um, can we, I mean, uh, like broaden the scope of resilience to, to actually include um, being able to be in a better position after responding to the shock so that the same shock doesn't have the same effects when it reoccurs. Yes. Otherwise, I mean, stakeholders, they are resilient. We will say they are resilient. But is there something better than just being resilient? Yes. I think this is this I've been is thinking. absolutely yeah. crucial. Thank I mean, you. Thank you. Thank you, Niagia. That's that's really helpful. I mean, I mean, I agree with you that actually any um, forest and farm producer organization that is functioning will have already overcome many shocks and not just climate related shocks, but also a range of other challenges that they will have uh, survived through. And the challenge is not just to stay static. So the next time that shock happens, they have to go through the same process, but actually to think through some options that allow you to be in a better position to face the shock when it happens next time round. And I think that's that's what we're going to try and explore today, uh, our options to effectively get ahead, advance, so that the next time a climate shock of a certain sort happens, we're in a better position to maintain our businesses and, and livelihoods in the face of that shock than we were the first time round. So thank you for that really useful set of points, Niagia. Do we have anybody else who would like to comment at this point? Yes, Mark. Yes, Duncan, thank you. Um, I just wanted us to also look at it also in terms of um, the existing policy environment. I think you alluded to it as far as, for instance, how FFPOs can mobilize themselves and to an um, active voice to be able to influence policy. Because um, I think that also has an overarching effect on how resilience is built, especially in the national context. So for instance, um, one of our key areas um, is wood fuel and how wood fuel can um, be done more for sustainably. So the question of charcoal and its effects on deforestation is quite an, um, a tricky area, especially for most countries across Africa. I, I know some countries are even um, advocating outright bans, but we also see the livelihood um, shocks that can also uh, occur as a result of same. So um, what um, can you expand further in terms of the policy or legal yeah. um, environment that can support this process of building resilience? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And that's a really, uh, especially since this is primarily an African training, I mean, wood fuel and charcoal is, is such an important um, energy source. You couldn't do without it. Um, and it's often been painted as a, a negative thing because of the damage that is done to forests and tree resources. But actually, because trees grow, as long as you uh, harvest your fuel wood and charcoal in a sustainable way, it should be a never ending source of relatively low carbon um, energy. Every, every bit of charcoal that's burned and releases carbon is matched by a tree that is growing and taking carbon out of the atmosphere. 
So I guess the role of FFPOs has to be to develop the systems of charcoal production that are sustainable, that can be shown to be sustainable and not damaging the forest resource, and then to work with the policy um, and legal sort of world in their country to try and endorse and recognize and support those sustainable businesses rather than banning them. And I think often bans have a completely counteractive effect because they don't stop the charcoal production uh, because people need the charcoal and the fuel wood for energy. All they do is criminalize or impoverish the people who are trying to, to produce that fuel. So in Kenya um, last year, the FFF team uh, did a, a survey um, of a vulnerability for particular groups of people, particular producer organizations. And they found that the ban on charcoal in Kenya, uh, at, coupled with the COVID crisis, had meant that uh, populations of people who used to be charcoal producers were among the most vulnerable in the country. And they made the case to the social protection department of the government of Kenya, who actually then listed those organizations and the people in those areas as recipients of social protection payments in a way that they hadn't done before. But they haven't yet succeeded in persuading the government of Kenya to have a slightly more nuanced approach where people who are doing sustainable production of charcoal uh, should be allowed to continue and encouraged, um, whereas those who are, who are continuing to do it without thought to sustainability are slowly eliminated from the supply chain. So that's very important work for apex level FFPOs, I think. And thank you for, for doing that because the resilience of the people who depend on charcoal production and the landscapes where the trees are growing for charcoal production depends on a good policy environment. Yeah, thank you. Well, let me move now on to the first of the uh, sessions where we begin to look at some of these options. Um, <clears throat> and I think I have to go there. So in this next module, um, we're going to start to introduce these 30 options for climate resilience. And we're going to start with social options. Uh, that means sort of organizational options that can help you build resilience. And that's because we're, we're talking primarily to an audience that is trying to strengthen forest and farm producer organizations. So let's start with what can we do within an organization to build resilience. And um, I'll just uh, revisit uh, this. So we've got these two bits of resilience. There's the assessment bit. You're talking about, can we predict the hazard? Do we know how vulnerable people are to it and how much exposure they're going to have? And then we have these resilience responses. And I've said there are four ways to respond. Um, and the first of those ways is to think about, um, are there changes we can make uh, to our social organizations that will make us more resilient in the face of climate change? Um, you can look at this diagram. It's in the, it's in the handout at the end of the day. Um, so, in the same way that there are four broad ways, we've clustered these 30 options for climate resilience into these four headings. So you'll see that there are eight um, options that we've put into the social and organizational responses category. And I'll try and go through these in, in more detail. Just to step back for a moment, why is social organization important? Why does it matter? And when we, we think of uh, people living in a, in a landscape, in a, in a rural area, of course they have many 
challenges to develop. And when we look at the sustainable development goals, we want, we want to stop poverty, reduce hunger. Um, we, we, we want to make sure that we have good health and education, gender equality, clean water, and so on. When you think practically, who, who will reduce poverty? Who will feed people? Who will, uh, you know, make sure of health care? It's often social organizations that do this in practice. It's often social, it's the farmer groups that educate each other on how to plant different crops and so on. And so in general, humans organize themselves to solve problems. That's why a human beings are such an unusual um, animal, if you like. We share information, we share skills, and that helps us to survive. Um, it helps us to build our resilience. And humans organize also uh, to do things more efficiently. So not everybody produces a crop, processes that crop, transports that crop, and sells that crop as an individual. You, you can organize so that some people are, are doing the growing, some different people are doing the processing, the transporting and the selling, and that can make it much more efficient. You can share the cost of doing that. And so you can, you can make uh, uh, you, your livelihoods improved uh, because you're, you're reducing your costs and you're, you're selling still the same thing. Similarly, humans organization organize themselves for power. Uh, so uh, we, we, we know how politics work. We know that politicians often don't listen to individuals, but if you have a big protest or a, a large group of people saying they need to see change, then politicians have to listen because they're elected in most countries. And we can also think of the ways in which um, you can have strength in numbers to get a better deal in the marketplace. So you have more power in the marketplace. The buyer knows that if they don't buy from you, you represent most of the producers. So they, they need to give you a fair price or they're going to struggle to get the product they need. So social organization matters. And in the forest and farm facility, we, we, we are investing in social options. We have this slogan, organize to thrive. And you can see in a, in a country like Guatemala, how this works. So you've got local producer groups who are producing timber, cocoa, coffee, um, cardamom and so on. And they're organized into 11 regional associations that also do business, they, they do processing business, they provide their members with uh, business incubation services, they provide their member with finance and they do projects. So by organizing um, those many, many local producer groups into an association, the association helps them uh, with their business. And similarly, those 11 regional um, uh, associations are grouped into a national uh, alliance, uh, a national federation. And that federation has been very successful in lobbying um, the, the, the government for support to smallholder farmers and forest producers. So 1% of the national GDP in Guatemala now goes directly to support smallholder forest and farm producers. But they don't even stop there. That organization at the national level is one of a number of organizations that belongs to a regional alianza, an alliance called Alianza Mesoamericana de Pueblos y Bosques, the Alliance of Mesoamerican Forests and Peoples. And it's that alliance that was visible in the climate change negotiations, trying to say we need more money to getting down to forest and farm producers, and we want to have a finance mechanism that is specifically going to reach forest and farm producers. So organization, organized to thrive, 
is a really good vision to have in any country. And you can see it here in the example of um, honey producers in Bolivia. So many people produced honey at a very local level, um, but through social organization, this one local group of women called App Mill, who were producing honey, they joined Adapa Cruz, which is a, um, a regional level association of honey producers. And that association worked with the government to, to um, introduce new policies for honey producers because they recognized that honey producers protected the forest and that having people in the forest was very important to stop fire outbreaks, which were increasing because of climate change. And so by belonging to this uh, local organization and linking it to a regional organization, they managed to change a policy so that they could both protect themselves from fire and also improve their rights to the land and forest resources. When we think of diversification socially for climate resilience, what do we mean? Well, there are eight different things that we can do. Um, and you'll see this infographic. You could, you could take this infographic and print it. It's a, it's a high resolution um, graphic file that you could print, um, sorry, oops, that you could print and put up on the wall of your forest and farm producer organizations as a reminder of different things you can do to become more resilient. So you can, you can develop your organization and its systems so that people trust it more, so that the group runs more smoothly. You can develop services, training, and um, understand the needs of your members and try and help them more effectively. You can use your organization to represent you politically to get policies that support your resilience. You can use your group um, to build up the technical knowledge of your members um, in sustainable forest and farm management that's more resilient to climate change. And you can do put in place quality assurance things um, that will mean you can sell them for better prices and that additional money will help you become more resilient. You can incubate businesses um, in ways that diversify what is produced and sold. And so you're less reliant on a single thing and that can make you more resilient. You can save money, uh, have a joint savings and, and investment fund. And that can make you more resilient when a shock happens. You can, people can loan money to reestablish their farms or they can invest in new things. And finally, you can use your organization to link to other uh, organizations of a similar type and have strength that way. So let's look at these, each of these things in a little bit more detail. Um, firstly, um, organizational systems, ensuring that your group runs smoothly. Um, how do you do this? Well, you, you can improve the systems that regularize your membership so that members know their rights and resp responsibilities. You can clarify the leadership and decision-making rules of your organization. You can improve your finance and record keeping, and you can develop the skills of different people within your organization and, and, and their capacity to produce more quality. You can improve gender equality in each of these different areas. And I already mentioned this example of Lake Elementaita Tree Nursery Self-Help Group in Kenya. And one of the first things they did was to, to, to do a, a governance self-assessment. How is our uh, self-help group organized and functioning? How is it led? Does everyone know what the rules of membership are? Are we happy with the membership fees? Um, do we sell individually or do we sell as a group? And they did uh, that self-assessment of their organizational systems 
and then identified some gaps. They wanted to build up their collective marketing processes so that they could meet larger orders. They wanted to establish a joint savings and loan scheme so it would serve the needs of their members. So investing in the organizational systems is one way of becoming more climate resilient. And we shouldn't underestimate it, even though it's quite a general thing, set of things you can do. Those things do make your, your organization more resilient. They build trust, they make members happier to belong. And so they encourage people to work together more creatively and effectively. The second of these um, options is to think about how can we offer services to our members? And, and that's partly about knowing what your members need. Um, and, and particularly the members who might be most vulnerable. Um, so that you keep on board members who would otherwise fall away because they don't see benefit from belonging. Um, and and you, can, you can see in many of the forest and farm producer organizations, they have special programs to help vulnerable groups or women groups or youth groups. And the Artisanal Producers Association in, called Kalari in Ecuador um, looked at their membership and some of the challenges their members faced, and they found that women were particularly disadvantaged in, in making uh, in commercial opportunities, in, in selling things and in opportunities to work uh, in the association. And that was because of a, a kind of cultural ancestral patriarchy system <laughs> in, in their landscape. They have a sort of, um, they're indigenous people and they have a strong link with their landscape, a chakra production system, which is very diverse agroforestry, but it's mostly dominated by men. And so um, they challenged that. They said, well, we as an organization, Kalari, want to do this differently. We want to allow more women to participate in the, in the association and we want more of them to be in leadership and we want more of them to be involved in income generation. So they start to offer those inclusion services to women particularly. Um, and you can see that on some of the packaging. Can you see that they're, they're promoting um, women's opportunities in this case in vanilla, or vanilla production in their association? And there is another example um, this is uh, chocolate uh, and it's being branded as a, a happy couple rather than just men. <laughs> um, and uh, a third option for what you can do with your organization is you can increase its political representation. Uh, you, can, you can make the case that we are the people, a large number of people in rural landscapes and you have to listen to us. And that's all about building relationships that shape government decisions. So you, you take people who are particularly articulate in your group and you try and find ways of linking them to authorities who control land tenure, agricultural, forestry, uh, transport rules and finance, terms of finance, and making sure that women and men are both represented to, in those in those um, representational duties. And so an example of this uh, is the Bolivia, Bolivian Federation of Agroecological Producers and Collectors of Cocoa. In, in Latin America, they love these long titles. Um, Fed Prasao CBBA. And they helped to establish a national cocoa federation, Coprasao. And Copra Sao went to the government and they said, well, we're your largest export crop and we represent the producers, all the thousands of producers of your largest export crop. And we need to have a cocoa support program. You don't provide us with any support. And so the government listened because there were so many voters represented by Copra Sao. And so they established a $21 million cocoa support program over five years. 
that's a way in which your social organization can build resilience. Here's some information. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, a fourth option is in the area of technical extension. Some of your farmers will have particular gifts at uh, production. Some farmers will produce agroforestry systems with many, many different types of, of planting. Some will have received training in ag agronomy or, or agriculture at a university perhaps. So the trick is in a, in a forest and farm producer organization to make sure that those people are given the role of providing and sharing good information. Now, you can not only do this with what crop varieties, what seed sources and so on you can use, but also you can try and use your organization to link into weather forecasting and climate predicting uh, sources of information so that your organization equips people not only predicting what might be the changes in the future, but also on the sorts of crops and seed sources, where to get them from, the planting arrangements, and making sure that those trainings, the technical extension trainings work for both men and women. And again, this, this Bolivian uh, Fed Prasau, what it did was it formed youth squads, um, which were called Esquadrillos, and they went to the Agricultural Research Center and learned how to do grafting of cocoa so that they could graft in more climate resistant cocoa varieties. Or App Mill, which was another producer organization in Bolivia. That was a woman's honey production group, group. And they sent some of their members to get trained in beehive, modern beehive production, honey processing, what equipment you need. And those women then passed on their training to all the members of the group. So technical extension can be a really important way of building resilience. This might seem like a strange one, because it seems a little bit odd to have quality assurance. How does that link to climate resilience? Well, if you can set and certify high standards of quality and sustainability for your products, you can gain access to markets and get better prices for your products. That will increase the amount of money in your group and allow them then to invest that money in further diversifying and enhancing your, your basket of products that you sell to the market. So the Vietnam Cinnamon and Star Anise Cooperative, they um, were originally a group of four groups of cinnamon tree growers. And they decided to establish a cooperative because they knew that they needed lots and lots of members to have enough money to afford to invest in a processing facility. And they got money from a buyer and they went to the bank and they built a factory, but they also um, started to think about the quality of their products. So they turned 500 hectares of their cinnamon plantation into organic cinnamon that didn't use any pesticides or, or chemical fertilizers. And, and they divided their products into 12 different types of cinnamon product so that the, the quality, the organic label can then be sold to various different markets, not just people who want cinnamon powder, but also all sorts of different products like cinnamon sticks and cinnamon chips and cinnamon oil and so on. And, and the quality of their production meant that the buyer was willing to invest his money into the building of a factory. And he helped them negotiate a loan with the, with the bank to do that because he, the buyer wanted to have this guarantee of quality product coming into his company. And so he was willing to, to invest in it. So quality assurance can often build your resilience in the long term. We talked on the first day about business incubation, but I'll just revisit it here. Business incubation is one way to become more resilient. 
if you have a, a, a unit within your organization that accompanies people over a long period of time and helps them develop their business, helps them with all the links they need to make uh, with customers, with uh, authorities, with exporters, with people who can provide advice, um, then you will nurture those businesses and, and that will give you resilience in the long term, especially if they're very diverse businesses and especially if you are also making sure that there are women's groups with women's businesses to support their husbands and so on, so that you have two sources <clears throat> of income within the household. So the Laliguras Herbal Women's Group in Nepal, they, they started a business producing aromatic oils. In their fields, they grew aromatic herb plants and they bought a, a cylinder for distilling those oils into oil products that could be sold um, in, in the supermarkets. But once they develop those business skills, they have a financial accounting and so on, then they're able to establish other businesses. So then they were, were diversifying into fish farming and tourism. And they have a renewable energy uh, unit in their businesses. And the more businesses they're running, the less likely it is that any one of them will fail because of changes in the climate. So the climate change might have affected the aromatic oil production. It might reduce the yield of aromatic oils, but it won't affect the tourism um, because that's not so dependent on, on the temperature or the rainfall. So they become more resilient through business incubation. We also talked a little bit <clears throat> in earlier days about some of the things you can do in an organization as an organization to, to, to provide finance. And that was um, uh, one of the options was to develop a savings fund, a, a savings and loan fund. And here is a, a group of women in Zambia called the Tubeleki Women's Club. And they, they were built around the Village Savings and Loans Association that would loan money to each member for buying seed or doing whatever they needed to do on the farm and then repaying the loan at the end of the year. But because they developed good financial accounting systems, they then also managed to have a deal with Zanaco, which is a bank, which offers mobile banking services at community level. So some of the women became agents of loans from the bank. So not only can they have loans from their own savings and loans association, but they can now also get access to uh, loans from a commercial bank. So thinking, mobilizing your finance, building your financing re track record, having somebody, a treasurer, who's really skilled in managing finances can often lead you to access more money from outside the community. And that can build your resilience. That means you've got money to invest and diversify your crops and your, your farming practices. And finally, uh, this final thing you can do socially is to, to think about belonging to a larger association or federation or cooperative union, um, like-minded, linking with like-minded people who can share information and costs and boost your, your power with policy makers. And that, that can be a really powerful way of, of, of supporting um, the, the uh, representation bit that I talked about a little bit earlier. So Kan Bawaku in Ghana, sorry about the pronunciation. They've been involved with the FF team in helping to set up the Ghana Federation of Forest and Farm Producers, GAFAP. And GAFAP runs a series of dialogues on different types of policies to try and help their member producer organizations. And it already represents, I'm told, a million plus producers. So it's very powerful as an organization in representing 
and we'll see what the impacts of that are as we go forward into the future. So joining with others. It can also be that by belonging to GAFAP, GAFAP has a business incubation unit within it. And so you can get advice and support for your businesses. Cooperative union can really help you as you go forward. <clears throat> I think I must um, stop there and now take uh, a few questions on these eight areas, these eight social options um, for becoming more resilient. <clears throat> Um, I, hope, uh, I hope that's been helpful and gives you some practical ideas of things you might want to invest in in your forest and farm producer organization socially. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yes, Hosea. Uh, thank you so much, Duncan. Um, it's just um, a, a consent on, on option number two on the social options, where you talked about uh, membership services. Mm. Um, what I've discovered, the time that I've been with the association is um, members, do pay membership fee with an intention to get some services. Yeah, now the challenge is where um, you have uh, more members. For example, maybe you have 3,000 plus, 4,000 plus, of which you cannot meet each and every member needs and wants. Yeah, maybe you can just meet 70%, 80%, maybe 90%, but still, 10% won't, won't receive your, 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 your services. <laughs> then yes. you find that um, the, it's, it's annual membership renewal where every year they're supposed to pay membership. You would discover that um, the following year, the 10% won't do the renew because um, they did not um, receive any service from your, 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 your association, your cooperative. I've seen this being a, a, a challenge. Um, I don't know how that can be addressed, but that's, that's, that's what is happening. Nonetheless, you would, again, on other side, you would see that um, the 90% will also bring another maybe 5% because I know we benefited. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, yeah, but <laughs> that's then, Yes, maintaining the actual 100%, it's really becoming a difficult. At least you lose a certain percentage of membership because they did not uh, receive um, the services from your, your, your association. Yes, um, and this is a, a, it's, it's a constant battle for organization does belonging to an organization is it and paying the membership fees is that worth my while is a is a totally reasonable question that any um, farmer would ask and so um, any organization has to think um, how can we you know improve the services that we offer to our members now there are several things I want to, to say here. Um, firstly, um, when an organization is starting, um, often uh, the farmers within who've joined the group um, will, they'll sell together, but they'll sell as individuals. Um, so the group will maybe negotiate a deal with a buyer but everyone brings their product and sells um, to, to the buyer separately. And that's because the organization doesn't have enough money to uh, pay the farmers for their product, store it centrally, 
and then sell it on to the buyer. Um, so when those people pay their membership fees, then they're not getting any benefit uh, of, 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 in terms of price um, from, from the deal. So they're expecting uh, sort of advisory services or information as the main reward for their membership. Uh, that information about who to sell to, information about what crops to plant and so on. So in many of the more advanced um, uh, cooperative organization, you, you see this evolution where the organization gradually builds up a cash flow fund until it can buy, pay farmers directly for their product and then sell the product on. And, and usually by, by working as a group, you get better prices because the buyer, you attract bigger buyers, buyers who are offering to pay a better price for your product. And so if you can get to that position, the, the members are often happier because if they sell their product to the cooperative rather than the traders, they get a better price for their product because the cooperative is getting a better price for selling more uh, sort of product into the market. Um, and, that, and so that evolution, and then, and then you don't need to pay membership fees, you just deduct a small percentage of the sales price, and that's how that money from selling the product to the buyer is used to sustain the organization. I'm not sure if I'm being very clear there, but you need to slowly get to a situation where most of the money for running the organization comes from the business uh, operations that that organization does and not the services it provides to its members. Um, but there's still the question of, am I happy as a farmer with the services I'm getting for my membership fees? And, and one of the strategies for that is to use a sort of um, a farmer field school type approach where instead of trying to deliver training or advisory services to everyone, because there's so many members, what you do is you group your members and then have a representative and train those representatives in a trainer of trainer approaches so that you reach um, as, as many members as possible with useful services. Um, so I, I don't know if that, if that helps. But it is a it is a genuine challenge of you know providing services to your members. Often one of the things we found is that if an organization has provides services to particularly vulnerable groups, single mothers or um, handicapped people or youth, that actually people are happier to contribute their membership fee because even if they don't receive all the services they were expecting, they understand that the producer organization is itself providing useful services to more vulnerable people in their community. So there are various ways of, of handling that. And, and I'd be interested to hear other examples of, from other groups of how you handle that problem. Um, Yes, Mark. Hi, yes, Duncan. Um, this is not related just to um, what you just spoke about, but um, it's another dimension I just wanted us to um, to look at. And that's to do with land, especially to do with the social dimension and the social mobilization, as you've mentioned. Land and land use um, often remains a very critical aspect of um, uh, our various social arrangements. <laughs> And uh, tied to that is the role of um, local authorities and traditional um, authorities. Mm. So when you look at um, the issues around how we utilize um, land and um, the competing land uses, and then of course, um, other natural assets like uh, forest resources, there's often um, an opportunity um, if we work closely with the local level structures um, i.e. the chiefs and other um, people 
with authority at the, the, the grassroots um, level. Mm. So one uh, entry point for FFPOs is to um, using the social mobilization that you have already um, very well explained to be able to come to, to get an entry point for more opportunities around how they can support um, land use management, uh, sustainable management of uh, land use in consultation with these local um, um, authorities. And the chiefs, um, for instance, play a very significant role in this uh, direction. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. And yes, that's a really good point of, of uh, being able to talk about those land use issues at, the, at that a more local level. I think in Zambia, they've had um, quite a lot of success last year with mobilized groups of, of producers, uh, and including some women's groups, talking with the local chiefs to have land made available <clears throat> for, for women's production groups in a way that wouldn't have been possible if they hadn't been organized in a group. So yeah, absolutely. Any other point? Okay. <clears throat> so now let me turn to um, the last module of the day, and that's to do with um, not the social options, which we've covered, but the ecological and the economic options that might be available to you. And so there's quite a lot of information here. So I'll try and go through this uh, quite quickly, but you can see the green and the blue, the ecological things we can do, and then the economic things we can do to become more resilient. Um, and uh, there are, I think, seven ecological options and I think uh, seven economic options. Um, so let me see if I can uh, get this to work. So invest in your ecological options, enrich your nature. <laughs> um, and this is, is really thinking about moving away from single, um, single cropping production systems to more diverse agroforestry systems that will withstand the climate change a little bit more uh, robustly. And <clears throat> in Kalari in Ecuador, um, I've already mentioned that their primary product is, uh, is, is cocoa. Um, you can see the lady on the right who's picking the cocoa pods to make chocolate. But over time, they've realized that um, their system, their production system works better if it has a wide diversity of, of crops and, and plants within it. And so they've enriched their agroforestry systems over hundreds of years as an indigenous people with all sorts of different fruit, uh, nut trees, uh, spices, gums. We saw their vanilla pod production from orchids uh, as well. Um, and those agroforestry systems really provide the basis for their resilience in the face of climate change. So what are the things that you can, you can do ecologically? Well, there are many words people use for this. They call this nowadays uh, nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based adaptation or integrated natural resource management. But when you look behind those terms, usually they all talking about really these seven things. You can make sure that your whatever it is you're planting is well adapted to the changing climate. So if it's getting drier, then you're planting things that are able to cope. The second thing you can do is you can enhance the number of things you're planting. You can 
you can enhance the number of crops, which reduces the risk that any one crop will fail, either from, from a weather-related thing or from pests and diseases. Thirdly, you can uh, be a little bit more strategic about uh, how you lay things out on the land. So you might, if you're on a very steep slope, want to have rows that go along the contours to protect the erosion, protect the soil from slipping off. And you have those trees, fruit trees or fodder trees, interspersed with your crops in some new way. And that links to the next one, which is soil erosion control. What we don't want ecologically is to lose the fertile organic matter. So there are various ways uh, of, of reducing erosion. Um, and I've mentioned um, the, the planting of, of hedges. Um, you could also do sort of grass strips. You can terrace the land um, and, and various other ways. You can do minimum tillage. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, pest management is, is, a, is a thing that is important ecologically. And so uh, you can use an integrated approach that maybe rotates where you plant crops, that breaks up crops into different blocks so that pests and diseases that do break out don't spread or they aren't retained in the soil. Um, and, and there are ways of, of more diverse systems generally suffer less from, from pests and diseases. You can enrich, we, we said you, you don't want your soil to erode, but you can also actively enrich your soil. Um, you can plant nitrogen fixing trees, you can use organic matter, waste material from, from cattle and, and livestock to enrich your soil, which retains moisture and makes it more resilient to, to drought and to water shortage. And, and then you can diversify away from just planting crops into tree-based productivity systems um, that use maybe some of these trees are legumes and they can fix nitrogen, which is important for soil fertility, or maybe it provides protein-rich fodder for your cattle. When I was a younger man, I used to collect trees of agroforestry species and we introduced Caliandra calathursis into the highlands of Tanzania and Kenya. And it greatly increases yields of milk uh, when you feed cattle with both grass and a nitrogen rich um, tree fodder. So those are basically the ways that you can diversify ecologically. And I'll look at those in a little bit more detail now. <clears throat> Climate adapted stock. So you have to find and plant things that are hardier in terms of species and varieties or change from depending solely on crops to moving into trees or livestock varieties. The organization can link to botanic gardens or seed centers, uh, uh, government um, uh, research agencies, and you can often um, work with farmer-assisted natural regeneration in dryland parts of Africa. A lot of the success in the green belt movement in the drier areas of Africa is through farmer-assisted natural regeneration. You can, if you're a farmer organization and the people are having trouble with getting access to seeds, you can get access to these more uh, drought resistant varieties and then set up a seed stand yourself to provide seed for your farmers. And you can develop nurseries and so on that supply your farmers with a, a more diverse range of possible crops. So uh, again, in, in Ghana, Kanbaoku has um, introduced more drought resist resistant varieties of the main crops such as millet and sorghum and it's planting drought resistant trees such as parkia or balanites so that you can use those fruits to, to, to generate income and not depend just on your millet and sorghum. In terms of biodiversity enhancing, you can grow 
more diverse plants, which reduces the risk of total crop failure. <clears throat> so um, you can protect natural forest areas uh, alongside enriching the number of trees and, and, and crops and livestock species that you, you grow. Uh, and, and again, bear in mind that men and women might have different access to land. So you need to think both about homesteads and home gardens and uh, conventional fields and agricultural areas. And, and the Laliguras Herbal Women's Group in Nepal, um, they were depending uh, originally on just one aromatic oil species. So if, if that one, if the climate changed in such a way as to make that one difficult to grow, they would have been in trouble. Whereas now they've got about, I think, seven, eight different species of, of different aromatic oils. And that reduces the risk of failure in any one of their things and makes sure that their aromatic oil business will be resilient. Then there's this question of, well, how do we optimize the spatial arrangements of, of our plants, increasing productivity with clever arrangements of trees and crops? And if you're lucky enough to have um, been to, to, to agricultural college, um, there was a, a, an example in Kenya of an agronomist who had this hyper diverse system where it was planting macadamia nuts and palm trees and cocoa and coffee and regular crops and and timber trees and um, you know he had nitrogen fixing trees mixed in there and and arranging the crops and trees and livestock elements to maximize productivity is often a bit of a skill that develops over time um, finding somebody who's got those skills and gradually training up your members um, is, is really good. You can use sequential planting often. So you can, um, if farmers need short term income, but they also want to grow trees, you can also um, mix crops into tree planting areas in the early years, and then they can sell the timber and stuff later on. And, and thinking of agroforestry in general is, is a good way. So Kalari that I mentioned, they've, they decided to expand the planting of traditional fruits and they gave training to their members on what are the light requirements for those fruit trees, which ones can you plant under shade, which ones need to be more in the sun. Um, and so they, they did an agroecological training to maximize the productivity within the cocoa agroforestry systems. And this also allowed them to use those native fruits as flavors for their chocolate, which because they were indigenous fruits and local, locally grown uh, coffee, uh, cocoa for, co for chocolate, um, that's obviously a marketing dream of indigenous people uh, producing chocolate with multiple flavors from traditional fruits. Um, so they've, as you'll see, I'll, I'll, I'll take it back, but they've got new buyers in Europe because of this strategy. And it's all built on spatially optimizing what they can grow in their fields. We talked a little bit about soil erosion control, stopping the soil from washing away. And, and this is really about reducing the runoff of water on, on fields, especially steep fields. You can use minimum tillage site techniques where you, you don't uh, completely um, weed and plow everything. You can plant on contours. You can have fallow cycles in what is sometimes called sort of traditionally called slash and burn agriculture. And I always feel that's very unfortunate um, because natural fallows can enrich and, and maintain soil fertility. Or you can have multi-story arrangements of crops and trees where erosion is much reduced because the infiltration of water into the soil is improved. And again, Kan Baoku in Ghana has been training members in zero tillage cultivation techniques to avoid soil erosion control. 
pest management um, in Vietnam when we went uh, the last time really I traveled <laughs> because of COVID. And um, there were outbreaks of pests and diseases on a number of the trees. So we need to be thinking about how do we, as the climate stresses plants, uh, they become more susceptible to pest and disease outbreaks. It really helps to have much more varied things on your farm that separate out the crops and make it harder for the pests or the diseases to spread, um, rotating your crops and so on uh, to avoid a buildup of soil borne or surface pests and diseases. Um, and you can do things like um, this group in Bolivia did where they were grafting using um, pest resistant cocoa varieties that had been developed in the research station and then they came in and they began to graft them into the rootstocks of their existing cocoa groves and that's helping them to 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 get away with more pest resistance. Soil enrichment, um, we all know about this. You can collect uh, household waste and farm waste. You can put it in, in tubs or you can collect animal slurry. You can plant nitrogen fixing trees, which you then as hedges, which you can then harvest and use that as compost. They're all natural ways of enriching soil fertility, which don't require farmers to buy expensive chemicals. And they also enable you to produce things organically, which can increase your market, um, uh, uh, sort of your, your marketing and get better prices for your product. So Noviva in Togo um, was encouraging its members towards slightly more mixed agroforestry systems using livestock, goats and, and so on as a source of manure uh, and composting sites to support cassava production which was their main product. And that was improving their, their climate resilience. And then you, you the same group, uh, you can use tree-based productivity. So uh, legume trees have a, a, in their roots um, a rhizobium, which fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere that's, that's in the soil and, and then turns it into um, uh, nitrogen rich proteins and you can integrate those trees we all know them Lucina leucocephala can be terribly weedy um, Gliricidia sepium Caliandra calathursus and so on so those sorts of trees if you grow them on farms in places where they're not going to interfere with your with your crop you can harvest the green um, manure and then dig that in as a fertilizer into, into subsequent years. And that can greatly increase your, your productivity, again, without needing to pay for expensive uh, external fertilizers. It does uh, have quite a lot of labor constraints, so you need to think about it and plan it carefully. Um, so those are some of the ecological things that you can do. Actually, you know, that's quite a short list. So. I think any forest and farm producer organization should be able to do all of those seven things. And there's not really much else you can do ecologically to become more resilient in the face of climate change. Let's talk about some economic options now, the blue economic options. Oh, before I do that, before I, I talk about economic options, let me just give you a, an example of one of the economic options for being more resilient in the face of the COVID pandemic. I mentioned this the other day, so I've just included a slide on it here. So what you see on the left is a website of a producer organization in Ecuador um, called Intag Productivo, which set up an online store and delivery service. So they had a van, and they have those boxes, those crates, and the farmer organization is producing a wide variety of vegetables and fruit um, in, their, in their farming systems. And so people could order what they want online, and then the ladies in the picture will put that into crate for you and deliver it to your house 
so that you don't have to go to a busy marketplace to do your shopping. Oh, they also sell coffee and uh, meat and, and artisanal products, um, which the producer organization produces. So it's quite a diverse, it's like a, a supermarket on wheels, um, which they've developed. And they did that uh, alongside uh, having a market, a physical market that was specially set up to allow the social distancing in line with government reg regulations um, so that they can sell their products. So we're going to look at some of these economic options for resilience. Um, I, I talked a little bit about the COVID, but we're talking here about climate resilience. So how do you diversify economically? How do you become economically more resilient? You can diversify your membership. You can, you can increase the scale of your organization. Um, the more product you have available, and it can be not just product of one thing, but many different types of product, the more your organization will have um, resilience and sustainability. An area to invest in is, is in stock information, making a, an effort to calculate what stock you have from your members, preferably in some kind of aggregation yard or store, so that buyers can quickly know whether you can meet their order. And, and the FFF has been running these trainings for timber producers on calculating through inventory some of the timber production so that we the, the, the producer organization knows how much timber it can actually sell. And that gets you away from the horrible situation where the, you agree a, a, a contract with a buyer and then find that you can't meet the order because you don't have enough stock. Um, that can make you much more resilient um, it, it, by keeping your buyers and, and, and um, improving um, your sales information. Then you can, you can do much with the, the, the products you already have. So you can process and package. Uh, if you refine your product packaging and marketing, um, then uh, you can often reach new buyers and so we talked about this with honey, putting the honey in smaller, smaller bottles. But you can, you can uh, use a product and often process it in different ways and sell it in a different packaging to different sorts of buyers with flowers and, and grain products. Um, and, and we've all seen uh, some of the examples of um, cosmetic products um, over the last few days where the packaging is all important because people want to feel that it's a beautiful product. You can try and diversify the number of distribution channels, the number of people you're selling your product to. So really trying, working hard to find new buyers for your products so that you're not so dependent on a single buyer and, and therefore you, you've got economic profits, even if some climate related catastrophe um, stop some buyers from buying your product. You can, of course, diversify the number of things you're sell, selling, horizontal dis diversification, so growing and making new things. And that's, that's uh, we've, we've seen that in several of the examples that I've just showed. So the cocoa producers now doing fruit production, um, the aromatic oil producers in Nepal now doing fish farming and tourism you can diversify that and that can make you resilient in the face of climate change. You can work on your marketing. You can say catchy things about your product so people, people are more likely to buy it. Um, and if there's difficulty in supplying things to a certain market because of things like COVID or, or so on, then you can, you've got other options for marketing your product in other ways. And you can do vertical integration. Horizontal integration is when you're producing more or different types of thing. Vertical integration is when for a particular value chain, you control more of the steps. So you control the transport, you control the, 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 the sales and distribution. Um, 
and that's a way of uh, diversifying economically. And all of these things will help you become more resilient to climate change. So let's look at that uh, sort of increasing the scale of, of production. Uh, and we heard in our homework session this morning of uh, a single lady, I think, or maybe two ladies in Liberia working on avocado production. Um, if you can expand the membership of these groups, get more people planting a thing, then it's much more likely that you'll attract interest from buyers. And that will in turn make it more likely that you'll sell your product, which will make you more resilient if avocados is one of the things that you want to develop production of. Um, so yeah, selling bigger volumes um, means that you can get bigger customers, sometimes who pay better prices. So this tree nursery, again, coming back to this tree nursery in Kenya, it developed collective marketing for the nursery. So rather than a buyer having to go to a single nursery, they offered the opportunity for buyers to, who wanted to buy a lot of a particular species. And they said, we'll work as a group to meet those orders. And so some of the bigger clients were like the Cooperative Bank of Kenya um, and the Green Belt Movement. And they're asking for 100,000 seedlings and no single nursery can meet that order. But if you can meet that order by working as a group, then obviously that's going to make you more money and all of the individual groups will be better off. Um, so that's, that's worth thinking about. Improving your stock information, both keeping track of what product volumes you have and differentiating your product into different quality grades or into different product types. Um, so for example, if you're a timber producer and you're just producing um, uh, large scale trees for the saw milling market, you might be able to sell some of your trees, but there are many trees that are a bit crooked or, or of smaller dimension. Well, if you, if you separate those two things, so you have the best quality trees going to the sawmill, but the smaller, more crooked trees, they can go into things like um, fencing or uh, charcoal and fuel wood production and so on. Then you can make more money because instead of saying, well, we can't sell half of our trees, you find that you can sell all of them and, and that uh, can increase your, your profits and make more money. And that's what the Vietnam uh, Star, Cinnamon and Star Anise Cooperative did. They realized there was a limited market for, for cinnamon powder, but people were also wanting cinnamon products to put in large stews, larger bits of cinnamon, or to, to use in a, as a sort of a, a scent uh, through oils. And so they, they diversified what they made out of cinnamon and so they've got many different markets. And if any one market fails, they've still got many products they can sell to other buyers. All of this keeps your revenues flowing. And, and, and when there are, are, are challenges to that, it keeps you more resilient. So there's a processing and packaging you can do. Um, this is a, a Noviva in Togo. They're developing high quality packaging and labeling for four main cassava products. So tapioca, gari, starch powder, and cassava bread flour. They have different buyers for each of those products. And by making the packaging really nice and by diversifying um, their product, they're becoming more resilient as a business. And you've seen already some of the other ways in which they're producing resilience on the farm. So this is um, refining and packing products that last. If your product lasts and can store, then you can sell it in the off season when other people can't sell their product. And that gives you an advantage and makes you more likely to survive when other people can't sell their product. And this is uh, distribution channels. 
So try to find and diversify the outlets that sell your products. Um, so this is coming back to this Kalari uh, chocolate and you can see all of the different varieties of chocolate that they're now selling. And because of that, a Swiss chocolate manufacturer um, entered into a deal with them because they're selling chocolate that nobody else in Switzerland is selling. And it's from a community organization. So anybody who buys that chocolate knows that they're both helping to support sustainable agroforestry production systems. They're also benefiting indigenous people who, who produce these craft that you can see in the photo. Um, so you can, you can use one product to help you sell other products if the quality is good. Uh, and, and you're selling to, to many different sorts of markets. And then producing new things, so growing and making new things. Um, Jeff uh, Campbell was very much pushing the idea of a basket of products. And the reason for that was that, you know, we do want producer organizations to be resilient. So we don't want a failure in one thing to mean that the whole producer organization collapses. And, and this group, Kalari in, in um, Ecuador, as well as producing chocolate, now produce other products like the vanilla you see in the photo here um, and the fruit and the juice and other things they sell. Um, oh yes, that's a, another thing they sell is this guayusa tea. We don't have that in much in Europe or Africa, but it's, a, it's effectively just a different type of tea um, and and they, they can plant that in the understory of their agroforestry systems. So it's an additional way of making money. And better marketing. So uh, putting labels on that, that, that are attractive, having a very professional bottle or product or jar or package. Um, and you can use uh, visual imagery, so you can develop a strong brand like this Tresor and Sons brand that um, this Madagascar uh, company Manarivo AB is, is producing. Um, you can also use pictures and videos that tell the story of your producers so that supermarkets can have a, uh, you know, can have maybe some packaging where people get to learn about how buying this product will be helping poor people in rural areas. And so all of these things work to mean that your product will be the one that people buy and the resilience of your group will continue in the face of, of changing climates um, and changing markets and changing politics and changing diseases. And finally, there's this option for vertical integration, um, and that's to take on more stages in the value chain. So instead of just making money from growing the timber, you also capture the value from transporting it or even processing it into sawn timber. And TT Gao in Tanzania has been helping local tree growers associations to take on the agro dealer role of collecting and transporting timber as a way of improving their profitability. If they're more profitable, they're more likely to be able to continue into the future. I hope that's uh, um, enough. Uh, I've, I've got to number 21 <laughs> out of 30. And I, I hope that you will download that infographic um, so as a reminder of things that an organization, a producer organization like yours could do to be more climate resilient. But do we have any questions so far on the, the, uh, the information I've, I've been putting across just now? Kata, are there any comments in, in the chat? Um, there was a comment on um, um, on partnering with uh, different organisations um, mm. to address climate change risk. And Tosia was mentioning a number of um, acronyms which we might not all be familiar with. Uh, okay, um, this is 
Hosea, is it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Our association has partnered with other climate change actors like CFU, Comaco, that's a company, I think. Um, Zambia, Zillafip, that's a World Bank program on climate, I think, to, to fight this climate change. And I think that's absolutely super, Hosea. Yes, I think one of the ways of um, coping with climate change is to partner, is for an organization, a producer organization to, to use its institutional structure to be a project partner. Um, there are often projects and funding climate finance, both for adapting to climate change and to help mitigate climate change. And we'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. Um, one of the end points of this training will be to think, how can we use all of this climate resilience understanding to help us get climate finance flowing to producer organizations um, and, and starting to develop those partnerships uh, being an implementing partner uh, for some of these projects is a really good way to, to build that. Any other questions? I know it's a lot of information to take in and you'll see that some of the um, options are things you'd think, well, we're doing that anyway because of economic reasons. And that's perfectly okay. I think climate resilience, being resilient to climate change is partly about your ecological, do your crops survive in a changing weather? But it's also things to do with, is our organization set up to develop a, a diverse farming system? And do our businesses, are they set up to market multiple products? And you know, do we have the technology and infrastructure to do all of that, which we'll cover tomorrow? So that's fine. We haven't, haven't had many comments from women in this group. Do any of the uh, women farmers leaders, is all of this making sense to you? Yeah, hello. Hello, Alima. Yeah, they are making a lot of sense. As for the, the approach that we are using now is the best way. Uh, every uh, uh, strategy or every option is being very sensitive to women's needs and making sure that we are looking at them from the eye of the fact that we can always be homogeneous in looking at the issues because the men issues and men, women issues are always and will never always be the same. That's so for right. me, it makes a lot of sense that uh, you have been very, uh, as facilitator, you have been very conscious of all these differences and you don't lose, <laughs> you don't regret mentioning them. You are so proud when you are mentioning them. And for us, I think as women leaders, that's something we need to learn and know that uh, we have responsibility to always ensure that uh, we are raising the issues for better understanding. And we are doing that with the men on board. <laughs> yes. And the men are beginning to understand that, look, we can move forward, especially when it comes to climate, when it comes to resilience, when it comes to risk issues, when it comes to family sustainability, it comes to social reproduction. There is no way and no how you can do this thing, ignoring the other group, which is the women, because the care is from them. The happiness of home is from them. The peace we are all looking for is from them. The economic sustainability is from them. <laughs> the environmental sustainability is from them. The social sustainability is from them. So inclusiveness, diversity of opinion, social cohesion is the only way out. And for me, this training has been very much open to that. And we should never do anything without looking at the differences in terms of who takes more of the effect and who takes more of the benefits and how would balancing the two give all of us a very sustainable environment that we are all looking for. And therefore improve income for women, improve income for men, improve income for families. And at the end of the day, everybody is laughing. <laughs> That's so, so kind of you to say those, uh words and so much truth in them, Alima, and, and thank you for, for, 
for for putting that view um and i'm glad in part it's always uh, it's, it's quite hard for a for a, for a, a man presenter to try and cover these issues because um because i i you know i've got my own perspective but i'm i'm glad at least we're we're making the case that you do have to have this um, consideration of women and and their role and and what they can do in every element of resilience. Uh, it's so important and and partly as well because you know some of these issues are big for us, but for our children, uh, issues of climate resilience are going to be um, much more important. Um, I have no doubt about that. The data I see on the the impacts of changing climate it will really affect our children. So, and women play such an important role in in educating and and spreading awareness of these facts. So, so thank you. Um, now, uh, I think I've just got a, a two minutes left. So let's uh, just turn quickly, if we can. To the homework for today. This is your last piece of homework, so I hope you'll all put in some effort um, to it. Um, and let me share my screen. Um, and we'll go right down to the end. So the homework for today is for you to think about which of the options, those 21 options that I presented, are you already using in your organization? And I think you might find that maybe you're doing many of these things already, but maybe then add a few, one or two, um, let's say one from each category, one new thing that you might think about doing that you've learned about today and would like to explore further. So if you look at those first three, the orange, the green, and the blue options, and think, which of these are we already doing? And you could maybe describe in your homework one or two things that you're already doing, but then add in, well, here's, we learned about one new thing in the orange, one new thing in the green, one new thing in the blue that we might like to do a bit more of in the future. Okay? Is that clear for everyone? And I'll ask Ali if he can just share that slide in the chat um, so that uh, anybody who, who, who has struggles to get access can just um, uh, get access to that. Um, and, and then tomorrow morning we'll, we'll start and we'll hear from uh, hopefully some of you about examples of how you're working to become more climate resilient in your forest and farmer organizations already and a few new ideas that this training is helping to, to make you think about. Um, then I'll cover the last, uh, I couldn't cover all the four um, sections today, so we've got a few more options to do with physical and technological ideas that you might make you more res resilient. And then I'm going to um, step back and talk a little bit about how do we finance all of this. Um, so I hope that will, will provide you with a, 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 an interesting final day. Thank you for everyone who's joined today and taken part so actively. Um, it's been a great pleasure again to be with you. And um, with that, I'll, I'll close this training session, the fourth day of training, and we've just got one more tomorrow. Thank you so much for, for staring at a screen for so long. <laughs>